God, I thank you for everyone who's here tonight. And I thank you, God, that you are perfect. And you are the only one who can make us perfect. You know every need tonight, Lord. You search every heart. And so I ask that you would meet every need. That you reveal yourself to everyone here, individually in their own experiences. And show them how much you love them. It's all about being in love with you, in relationship with you. Nothing else matters. Everything else that matters only matters because of that, because of you and your plans for us. So Lord, I have my plan here tonight, but I offer that to you. Have your way tonight with what I prepared and let everyone hear what you want them to hear and only that. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to imagine that there's two people wearing two different pairs of glasses like you can see here. One is wearing red glasses, the other is wearing blue. The person wearing red, all they're gonna see is red. And the person wearing blue, all they're gonna see is blue. And so this is worldview. We all have a different worldview. And everything that we think about, everything we interpret is based on this. And so there's this cycle of changing worldviews in history. It's been going on since the beginning of human history. And it starts with experience. It's this isolated island that each of us kind of has. But then through experience, we have language coming forth. And then language leads to culture, which leads to tradition. But then culture and tradition impact then experience. And so it's the cycle of our worldview. But all the ways that we think and everything, it's based on this cycle. So the Christian worldview is formed by three things. Individual experiences, theological tradition, and hermeneutics, which is a very fancy way of saying Bible interpretation. So we talked about before this idea of replacement theology, which is that the church is God's chosen people now and not Israel. So it was understood before that the Jewish people were God's chosen people, but within early Christianity, they changed it so that actually no, the church is, they said. And this idea, we talked about it in past weeks, is wrong. No, that is not correct. But there's still this major Christian assumption that I want to address tonight. And this is the assumption. The group of all followers of Jesus are part of a worldwide community that was started by Jesus and his original disciples. This group is called the church. What does the Bible call God's people? That's what I want to ask. Is this what the Bible says? So naming God's people based only on the Bible. Tonight's summary, all we're going to cover in five points is this. First, the rock foundation of God's people is Jesus only. Two, how the Bible reveals the church is an illegitimate pagan organization. I know that's a radical claim, but you'll see. How the original languages show us that God's people from all nations are his flock. How Jesus, Paul, Isaiah, Peter, and Jacob affirm these realities. And finally, God's desire for his people's unity, all his people's unity, no matter what they're calling themselves. We begin with Matthew 16, 18. That's our key verse for tonight. Jesus says here, and this is the Legacy Standard Bible, and I also say to you that you are Peter, the Greek is Petros, and upon this rock, Greek is Petra, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So there's this Catholic teaching based on this, that Peter is the rock, and he was the first pope. Is Peter the rock? No, no. Based on what we've talked about so far, you can see that. How do we know, though, the Bible? So now I'm going to prove this to you, and we're going to talk about who is the rock. So the full context of this passage. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, saying, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And remember, the Son of Man is a major Jewish title for the Messiah in the book of Daniel. And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ which is Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Messiah. So key points from this. Number one, this passage is all about who Jesus is. Peter receives the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. The Greek word Petros, which is Simon's new name, Peter, means small stone. The Greek word Petra, which is the foundation of the church, means bedrock. It's a different word. It's not a small stone, it's the, the foundation, the bedrock. In other words, Petros is a very small chip off of the Petra. In the same way, Peter is a very small part of the rock in this passage. So who is the rock? 
The rock is Jesus, is the Messiah, and as God himself. And I don't think you need more convincing, but in case you do, we're going to go a little deeper. So Matthew 7, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock same word. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. And then in Luke 6, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug and went deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the river burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. In 1 Corinthians 10, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock who followed them, and the rock was Christ. And then Peter says, And coming to God as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is chosen and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who trusts in him will not be put to shame. This precious value then then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this stumbling they were also appointed. And at the end of this passage, Peter's quoting from Isaiah, and Paul does the same. Romans 9, Paul's describing how Israel has historically rejected God. What shall we say then, that nations who did not pursue righteousness laid hold of righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith? But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not attain that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I am laying a stone in Zion, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and the one who believes upon him will not be put to shame. Again, Paul's quoting from Isaiah, and here's the Isaiah passage, Isaiah 8. For thus Yahweh spoke to me, Isaiah, with a strong hand and disciplined me not to walk in the way of this people, Israel, saying, You are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy, and you are not to fear their fear fear, and you shall not tremble. It is Yahweh of troops whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your cause of trembling, and he shall become a holy place. But to both the houses of Israel, and remember, it was the north Israel, and then the south there was Judah. There were two houses of Israel that are both Israel. A stone to strike and a rock to stumble over, and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many will stumble over them. Then they will fall and be broken. They will even be snared and caught. Bind up the testimony, seal the Torah among my disciples, and I will wait for Yahweh who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope for him. So very clear here, God is the rock. Petra in Greek, in the Septuagint, and in Hebrew it's sur. I know that sounds technical, but I'm pointing it out for a reason, as you'll see. So Back to Exodus 17, when Israel's thirsty in the wilderness. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And this is what Paul is talking about. So he's saying that Christ is this rock who's struck, and then the people get to drink the water. In Exodus 33, he's speaking to Moses after Moses asked to see God's glory. Then Yahweh said, Behold, there is a place with me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the hole. In Hebrew, this word means pierce place of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. I hope you can see how prophetic this is. In Numbers 20, throughout this passage, rock is Petra in Greek, but Salah in Hebrew. And Salah means lifted rock, specifically a rock that is lifted high, as opposed to the other one, Sur, which means grounded or bedrock, the rock that is the foundation, the low rock. 
Then Moses and Aaron came in from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of Yahweh appeared to them, and Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, and you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation, which the Greek here could be translated as church, the synagogue, and speak to the rock before their eyes, that it may give its water. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock, and let the congregation and their animals drink. So Moses took the rod from before Yahweh, Way, just as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. And he said to them, Listen now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? Then Moses raised high his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came forth abundantly. And the congregation and their animals drank. But Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. In Deuteronomy 32, as Moses Moses is singing a celebration song to Yahweh. He says, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just. David in Psalm 62, Attend my cry, O God, lift ear to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. In 2 Samuel 22, David again, Yahweh is my lifted rock and my fortress, and my escape, God of my rock, in whom I find security, my shield, and the horn of my liberation, my tower, and my retreat, my liberator, you liberate me from violence. In Isaiah 51, God himself is speaking here through Isaiah, and he says, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, who seek Yahweh, look to the rock from which you were cut, and to the quarry from which you were dug. So God, Yahweh himself, is the rock. Jesus is God in the flesh, and as a man, he is the Messiah of Israel, proven beyond all shadow of a doubt, this is the rock. So, back to the LSB, Matthew 16, 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Is this a good translation of the original language? Obviously for rock, I think it is. But what about church? What is the English etymology of the word church? From the Old English root kirk, or kirk with a K, root of the word circle and circus, pagans worshipped in circle formations. So there were churches of worship before that Christianity was ever even a thing. It is from pagan Gentile culture like our calendar and our days of the week. So I don't know if you knew this, but all the days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, etc., they're all named after Norse gods. Saturday is named after Saturn, Roman god. Sunday, day of the sun. Monday, moon day, day of the moon, etc. So paganism is just part of our cultural background just because of where we come from. Pagans have always worshipped in circles, but Yahweh told his people through their entire history to worship in squares, cubes, and rectangles. Yahweh's tabernacle, tent, that we talked about in the Bible, was a square within a rectangle. Yahweh's temple was a square within a rectangle. The holy place is always a perfect square. The New Jerusalem will be a perfect cube, yet square became an insult in popular culture. You're a square, people used to say. It's a little out dated now. So we are God's temple, a square, not a circle. This is not culturally popular in English history. Pagan English people worshipped in churches, circles like Stonehenge. Common pagan practice all over the ancient world, from Egypt to Rome, was putting an obelisk in a circle, and an obelisk is a big old structure, stone structure. You'll recognize it when I show you a picture in a moment. So this is Stonehenge, as you can see, a big old circle. This is what it would have looked like when it was complete. It's not complete like this anymore. And then this is an obelisk, an ancient Egyptian obelisk, and there's obelisks all over the world, but as you can see, it's usually put in a circle. And the reason for this, I know it's going to be a little awkward for some of you, but pagan worship rituals were often very obsessed with sex, and so the obelisk is meant to represent a penis, and the circle is meant to represent a vagina, and it's a fertility symbol. And they had them all over. They, there's an obelisk in Rome still in the Vatican. And then here we have the Washington Monument with a circle of American flags at the bottom. And here we have Yahweh's tent, the tabernacle, a square within a square, a rectangle within a rectangle. And here you have the Ark of a Covenant. It's a square. And here you have the temple, a cube within a square. And here is a portrayal of the holy city of Jerusalem. I'm sure it will look much more beautiful than this. But as you can see, it's it's a perfect cube. So with this understanding, we can confidently say that God never has a church in the Bible. Church is a terrible translation. Why is this translation so popular? There are 27 other popular translations that also use church in this verse, originally popularized by the King James Version of 1611. And I've listed all these other 27 translations for you, and the LSB is the one that you see on the screen here. There's five rare translations that translate it this way. Jesus says, and I also 
also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my congregation or assembly or community. Those are the other three ways these five translations do it. And so these are the only six semi-popular translations that use a more accurate English word to translate the original language behind this verse. William Tyndale, the original English translator of the Bible who was killed for translating the Bible into English. The Catholic Church killed him for doing this. Young's Literal Translation, the YLT, the International Standard Version, ISV, the Literal Standard Version, LSV, World English Bible, WEB or Web, the Tree of Life Version, the TLV, and that one is the one that I've been using here when I did read out of the Bible, really probably before I started doing these videos. So William Tyndale, in his original English translation of the Bible, you can see how he translated it on the screen here. Again, he was martyred, killed, for translating the Bible into English because doing so was illegal when he was alive. He was only able to complete the entire New Testament and Genesis through Joshua in his English translation, but it was enough to influence all other English translations really rely heavily on Tyndale. He was killed by King Henry VIII for being a Protestant against the Church of England, which was really just the Catholic Church, except instead of the Pope, you had King Henry as the head of the church, or whatever king it was. King James of the King James Bible, he was the head of the church when he was king. So King James himself rejected this part of Tyndale's translation. Why? It spoke against the church as an institution, especially an institution ruled by the country's government, which was the tyrannical Roman Catholic church system, or tyrannical Protestant systems that came after it, like the Puritans, Church of England, etc. So King James respected an honored the Church of England because he was the Pope of England, the original language. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my, the Greek word is ecclesia or ecclesia, and the Hebrew equivalent here is kahel, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Both the Greek and Hebrew words come from a verb root, meaning to call together a large meeting. And the etymological root meaning then is called out, called out. So outside the Bible, this word ecclesia, in certain ancient Greek cities such as Athens, democracy was the major form of government. This required meetings of the most important members of the city so that they could vote on various decisions. The meetings began when a trumpet was blown and all the members of the government came out from their homes listening to the call to meet and gathered together in the government building to meet. The name of this meeting was the Ecclesia. Now let's talk about Kahel. This is the Hebrew equivalent of the same word in the Bible. So the Hebrew word behind the same idea relates specifically to the shepherd's job of gathering all his sheep together in one place. The original root of the word meant gather to the staff. Jeff Benner, who I have this book right here, I'll show you. He's this amazing Hebrew scholar, he made this ancient Hebrew lexicon. It's fairly new in the terms of like the history of Bible scholarship. Recommend it if you're into the nerdy Bible stuff like I am. So Jeff Benner suggests this is the origin of the English word call, kahel call. In this original sense of the idea, you could translate this word as flock. This goes well with what Jesus says in John 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, and I have other sheep which are not from this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So the best possible translations then of Cahel and Ecclesia, in my opinion, based on all this, are flock, gathering, assembly, congregation, and community. This is my translation now because it rhymes. Matthew 16, Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my flock, and the gates of the underworld will not overpower it. So the church, then, is a sinful Gentile organization that began as a movement of God's true flock, and became corrupt through politics in human history. There is no basis for the institution of the church in the Bible. God does not have a church. He has a flock. Even so, flock is still a very general, non-specific name for God's people. So what does the Bible call God's people? We are not his church. We are his flock. God does not have a church. God has a flock. What does the Bible specifically call God's people? Matthew 10, And summoning his twelve disciples, Jesus gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve 
12, Jesus sent out after instructing them, saying, do not go in the way of the Gentiles, which is just another way of saying the nations outside Israel. And do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then we have Matthew 15. This passage, when I was a teenager and I read this, it actually really hurt my feelings. I had to go on this journey with God over it. Well, I'll tell you what it says. And going away from there, Jesus withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon, which was Gentile territory, specifically Canaanite territory, actually. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and were pleading with him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting behind us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and was bowing down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the puppies. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the puppies feed on the crumbs which fall from their Lord's table. And Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed immediately. Most translations will translate puppies as dogs there. So it sounds like Jesus is calling Gentiles dogs. But two things to think about when reading this. Number one, Jesus is specifically talking about pagan Gentiles. So he's not talking about people that trust him and believe in him. That's one thing to notice. Number two, the Greek word doesn't mean dogs in the plain sense because there's actually two separate words for dogs in the Greek language. This one specifically means the little like baby dogs, so like the puppies, which are cute. You know, when you think, think of the puppy photos on Facebook, it's like, oh, so cute. But also puppies are kind of dumb. They do things that hurt themselves. And they don't really know what they're doing, you know. You wouldn't take your child's plate and put it down and like give it to a puppy because it's just a different position within the household. So the Gentiles that don't believe, that's their position. They're, they're like the puppies. It's not that they're not loved. They're a beloved part of the home, but it's just a different position, you see. So Jesus very clearly established establishes that Gentiles are not God's chosen people, not by birth. Jesus came to save Israel from sin. But remember, God had always intended to use Israel to bring all nations back to him and away from the other gods. It's been a long time since we talked about that in Genesis. It's going to be key that you guys remember that as we talk about here tonight and then also the next two weeks because we want to remember these other gods, these other spiritual beings that God created seduced all the nations of humanity away from God. And so God took one man who couldn't have any children and he did a miracle and gave him a son at 100 years old, him and his wife, 100 years old, they had a son. And through this miracle child, he then built a nation, the nation of Israel, and chose them to be his people, to be a light to all the nations, and to, and to bring all other nations back to God, like a bridge back to God through Israel. But Israel failed to do this by continually joining the nations and being like them and worshiping the other gods. And so what God did then is he came as a man himself, a Jewish man though, an Israelite Jewish man, and he died and shed his blood for all of us to bring us all back and to thwart and expose evil spiritual power in the world. Still, what we looked at so far shows that God intended for Israel to be first and leader lords over all their nations, but not in the flesh, led by the Holy Spirit through what Jesus is doing. But that was God's intention. Paul the Apostle, as we know, is sent to the Gentiles. In Acts 9, Jesus is actually speaking to Ananias about Saul, who will become Paul. Paul is my chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. So Paul showed us that it's really all about the Gentiles now, right? Wrong. Paul confirms the Jews first. So Romans 2, there will be suffering and stress for every soul of humanity who works out evil for the Jew first and also for the Gentile, literally Greek here, because most Gentiles were Greek. Greeks at that time. For there is no bias, literally face choosing, with God. With these words, Paul reveals two things. God is completely fair in his judgment on all humanity, and Jewish people receive from God first before the other nations. This is both positive and negative. So in other words, the judgment of God falls first on the Jewish people as well before it falls on other nations. So where do the Gentile Christians fit in? I'm reading to you Romans 10 and 11, the whole passage, because I think it's the most important for the point I'm trying to make. Brothers, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for the Jewish people is for their liberation. For I testify about them that they have a passion for God, but not according to understanding. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to God's righteousness. For Messiah is the point of the Torah for righteousness to everyone who trusts. For Moses writes about the righteousness, which is from Torah. The man who does these things shall live by them. 
And I put verses in here so you can see what they're quoting. Because Paul's building an argument from reading the Hebrew Bible that was the Bible. So he's writing a commentary on this and building this argument based on these verses. But the righteousness from trust speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will go up into heaven, that is to bring Messiah down, or who will go down into the abyss, that is to bring Messiah up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of trust, which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and trust in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be liberated. For with the heart a person trusts, leading to righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, leading to liberation. For the scripture says, whoever trusts him will not be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever calls on the name of Yahweh will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not trusted? How will they trust in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim the gospel of goodness. However, they did not all attend the gospel. For Isaiah says, Yahweh, who has trusted our report? So trust comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Messiah. But I say, have they never heard? On the contrary, they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding, I will anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to an unsatisfied and defamatory people. I say then, has God rejected his people? No, never, ever. For I too am an Israelite, a seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Yahweh has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Yahweh, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have left for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In this way, then, at the present time, a remnant, according to God's choice of welcome, has also come to be. But if it is by welcome, it is no longer from works. Otherwise, welcome is no longer welcome. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not reached. But the chosen reached it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, Yahweh gave them a spirit of slumber, eyes to see not, and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. I say then, did Israel stumble so as to fall? No, never ever. But by their slip up, liberation has come to the Gentiles, which literally here is ethnicities or nations. to make the Jewish people jealous. Now if the Jewish people's slip up is riches for the world, and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fullness be? But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles. Since then, as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my service, if somehow I might move to jealousy my flesh and liberate some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And here Paul seems to be alluding to this passage in Ezekiel chapter 37 where the reunification of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah comes with the resurrection by Yahweh's spirit. And we'll get to that more in a moment. Paul continues, And if the first part is holy, the substance is also. And if the root is holy, the branches are too. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive branch, were grafted in among them, and became a partner with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast against them, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. And the root here is a reference to the prophecy of Jesus in Isaiah 11, where the Nazarene sect got their name among the Jewish people. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right, they were broken off for their distrust. But you stand by your trust. Do not be self-focused, but fear. For if God did not spare the born branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the goodness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity. But to you, 
you God's goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their distrust, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by birth a wild olive tree, and were grafted contrary to birth into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are the branches by birth, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not want you brothers to be ignorant of this mystery, so that you will not be self-focused, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be liberated, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will remove ungodliness from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. According to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but according to God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown compassion because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient that because of the compassion shown to you, they also may now be shown compassion. For God has shut up all in disobedience, so that he may show compassion to all. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and unfathomable are his ways! For who has known the mind of Yahweh, or who became his counselor, or who has first given to him that it might be repaid to him? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So here we see that God has one tree. The tree could be called Israel or holiness. Paul does not name God's tree, but he shows Jesus is the root and implies that Israel is God's cultivated holy tree. So where do the Gentile Christians fit in? The Gentiles are grafted into God's holy tree called Israel. There is no church, only Israel. Gentiles who put their faith in Jesus and make Jesus their Lord become part of the Jewish people, God's chosen people. So a bit more insight on this comes from the revelation of the two separate kingdoms of Judah in the south and Israel in the north that we talked about in the Old Testament. So remember, the United Kingdom of Israel back in the Old Testament was split in two. The southern kingdom ruled by David's royal line, which was God's chosen king and line, consisted of two full tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and gained a huge remnant of the other ten tribes of Israel. Officially, this was called Judah, and it became the province of Judea, and this is the origin of the Jewish people, as we discussed in previous lessons. But the northern kingdom was ruled by divided anti-David politicians. Officially, it was called Israel, and it became mixed among the Gentiles, creating the Samaritans and other Gentile ethnicities that have lost their heritage. It included the remaining ten tribes of Israel, led by the tribe of Ephraim, who was one of Joseph's sons. Ephraim is the name that really represents the people of Israel, the northern kingdom, as a opposed to Judah, the Jewish people. So with this in mind, we have a prophecy from Jacob all the way back in Genesis about the fullness of nations. And it comes in the context of Jacob blessing all nations in Ephraim. And so it says, Now it happened after these things that Joseph was told, Behold, your father is sick. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him. Then it was told to Jacob, Behold, your son Joseph has come to you. So Israel strengthened himself and sat up in the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, El Shaddai, a appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And he said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply, and I will make you a flock. And that word could be rendered as church. It's kahel, like we talked about. So God says to Jacob, And I will make you a flock of peoples, and I will give this land to your seed after you for an everlasting possession. So now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. And this is significant because Joseph's wife was the daughter of an Egyptian priest. So technically, Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's sons, they were only half Israelite, quote unquote, so to speak, if you want to go that route of where people come from. And they were half Egyptian, yet Jacob says they are mine. So Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are. Bring Ephraim 
to me, please, that I may bless him. His seed shall become the fullness of nations. So we see it established here that in Ephraim, the fullness of nations shall somehow be grafted in or brought in to the people of Israel and become part of the flock of peoples that belongs to Jacob, God's chosen one. So then we see this revelation throughout the Bible in the Old Testament and in the New that Jesus is God's simple covenant with Gentiles, with the nations. In Acts 13, it says, And the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul, slandering him. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. Since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring liberation to the end of the earth. And Paul's quoting here from Isaiah. So here's what Isaiah says. And really here, God, the Father, is speaking to the Son, or Yahweh is speaking to his servant through Isaiah. He says, I am Yahweh. I have called you in righteousness. I will also take hold of you by the hand and protect you. And I will give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who inhabit darkness from the prison. It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to cause the protected ones of Israel to return. I will also give you as a light of the nations so that my liberation may reach to the end of the earth. And Paul in Romans chapter 2 brings this revelation of true Jewishness. What does it really mean to be a Jew? Because when you think about it, Abraham, who was the first chosen one of God that led to Isaac, the chosen one, and then Jacob, the chosen one, among other brothers, really these men, they, they came from Babylon. They came from Babel. They came from Ur. They were Chaldeans by blood. Jewishness, really, it comes from Judah. And even Judah himself was connected with this other line of Arameans and Chaldeans and other Middle Eastern people. So what does it really mean to be a Jew on a biological level? It's much more complicated and mixed, but it's really a spiritual thing. And so this is what Paul is bringing here, because Judah means one who praises God with lifted hands or thanks God with lifted hands. It has to do with praising God with the hands. That's what Judah means, and that's where Jew comes from. So Paul then brings this revelation, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart in the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. And of course, today, I do think we have to be careful here because it's easy to take a verse like this and advocate for replacement theology, the idea that the church, which I've shown is an illegitimate institution, has replaced Israel somehow. But that is simply not true. The reality of it is, is that there is now a genetic line of Jewish people. There just is. We have to accept that. There are Jewish people by blood. And some of them are atheists, like we talked about last week. They're not all believers in any God at all, or let alone Jesus. So with that in mind, there is a Jewishness of the flesh, and there is a significance to that. I believe the Bible is saying, if we take it literally, because Jesus became a man. He came in the flesh, which means that flesh is not for nothing. But there's a spirit of the flesh, and that is from Satan. That is the, of the serpent. That is not the way of God. And so it's the spirit of the flesh, which is the self, that needs to be rejected and crucified. Jesus told us to take up our cross daily and follow him by crucifying the flesh, the self. But there is still value in the flesh, because it was the Gnostics who rejected the material world and said everything physical, everything of the flesh is just evil. So there is Jew according to the flesh today. And that's something to acknowledge. However, there is a true Jewishness, which is a matter of the spirit and not of the flesh. And keep in mind that it is the Jewish blood of Jesus, according to the flesh, that saves every one of us. So according to Paul, Gentiles who have put their trust in Jesus have now become part of Israel and the Jewish people. One day, the Jewish people will accept and trust in Jesus as their Messiah, and this will bring the resurrection. So question then, should Gentiles who believe in Jesus call themselves Jews? And what does the Bible say about Christians, specifically about the name Christians? So really the Bible says that it's acceptable to call yourself a 
Christian. In 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter is speaking to Greek-speaking Christians here. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the burning among you, which comes upon you for your proving, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree you are sharing the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may jump for joy. If you are insulted in the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a gossip. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be put to shame, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God must entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing good. So for Gentiles, it's absolutely natural and acceptable to call yourself a Christian because this comes from Greek culture and the mix of Greek culture with Jewish culture. And going even further, I don't want to create any sort of legalism here about saying that you're part of a church because it's not like a word itself is evil. It's about the heart. But I'm trying to say that the concept of church in culture and in history today comes from something that is pagan and that is evil. I'm not saying that it's wrong to say that you're part of a church or to call God's people the church, but I do think that's inaccurate according to the Bible if we take scripture literally and if we really care about the original context of these things. That's the point I'm trying to make, but I'm not trying to advocate for any legalism or obsession with what do God's people call themselves. I'm trying to just honestly admit this is what the Bible says about what God's true people call themselves. And truthfully, I believe Jesus said to me, I am the only word you need to know. This meaning that other than the name of Jesus, there is no salvation, there is no liberation, there is no hope. It's more about the Holy Spirit and what the Spirit of God does than about what we do or what we say in our imperfect languages. So now we come to the revelation of Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, where he talks about God's temple, the one new man. So Paul is speaking here to Gentile Christians, and he says, And you were dead in your fallings and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the age of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, in whom we all also formerly overturned ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the thoughts, and were by birth children of wrath even as the rest. But God, being rich in compassion because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our fallings, made us alive together in Messiah. By welcome you have been liberated. I'm going to pause for a moment here and comment on my translation choice because I think it's important. So normally this is translated by grace you have been saved and I put it by welcome you have been liberated. So I say liberated instead of saved because the idea of salvation in both Hebrew and in Greek is not this idea of being snatched away from danger like God takes you out of this evil world which is so evil the material world and just takes us up into a cloud in heaven and he, then he destroys the evil world. No, God's whole plan was to bless the material world and make it one with the spiritual world. It's a mystery. And ultimately, it has to do with liberation, setting free the material world, which has been enslaved to this evil spirit, really, that comes from the devil is the idea. And so it's a liberation. God isn't snatching us away from the earth. He's liberating us in the earth. He's defeating and conquering the enemies, his enemies, on the earth. And this is liberation, a setting free of the slaves, like he revealed to the Israelites when he delivered them out of Egypt. That's the first way God God reveals himself publicly to the whole world. Once the whole world forgot him, he revealed himself as the one who delivers, liberates the slaves from slavery. And so this is why I translate saved as liberated for this more freeing understanding that God wants to set us free. He does not want to trap us in religion. He wants to set us free to truly live the best life we possibly could and a life that will ultimately be eternal. And so then welcome, which is normally translated as grace. Again, in Hebrew and in Greek, there's this sense of welcome in that word. In Hebrew, it comes from two different words. One is hes said, which is usually translated loving kindness or kindness, but the idea is the nodding of a head. Every Hebrew word goes back to a picture ultimately. So the idea is that you nod your head to someone in approval and welcoming them. That's chesed. But then there's the word for grace in Hebrew, which is chen, and that word also has to do with the home. It's the idea of how you feel about your home and if you welcome someone into your camp, specifically if you're in the wilderness, you're in a camp as a nomad, or your home. If you have a home, it's the idea of welcome. And then in Greek, the word is charis, which is where we 
get our words charismatic and charity, but it has the sense of generosity and an open giving to others. This also is seen in the word welcome, when you welcome someone. So Paul says, God made us alive together in Messiah by welcome you have been liberated and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenlies in Messiah Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the overthrowing riches of his welcome in goodness toward us in Messiah Jesus. For by welcome you have been liberated through trust, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may brag. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Therefore, remember that before you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Messiah, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Messiah Jesus, you who before were far away became close by the blood of Messiah. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups, referring to faithful Jews and Gentiles, one, and broke down down the dividing wall of the barrier, the hatred, by releasing in his flesh the teaching of directions and decrees, so that in himself he might create the two into one new man, making peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, having in himself killed the hatred, and he came and preached the good news of peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our intimacy in one breath to the Father. So then you are no longer longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the holy ones, and belong to God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and this is referring to all the prophets before Israel, and throughout the entire history of Israel, because remember, before Israel, there were all these prophets, because some people interpret this as the foundation is the church, but that's not what this is saying. It says the apostles, yes, that relates to the movement that Jesus began, but also the prophets, and remember that apostle just means one who is sent in the original language. Church culture has just added so much baggage to our understanding of the Bible in translations. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Messiah Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being joined together is growing into the holy place of the temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into God's home in the breath. And so not only are we God's temple, but we are the holy place of God's temple, the one new man in Jesus. So Paul actually develops this revelation further and goes even deeper in Ephesians chapter 3 right after this. But we're going to discuss that next week. So then, the name of God's chosen people, inward and outward perspective. So if we take the Bible literally as the basis for how to name God's chosen people, we must admit that God calls his people Israel and the Jewish people. Gentiles who trust in Jesus, the root of Israel, are grafted into Israel and become Jewish on the inside. However, Peter also revealed that the Gentiles, or Greek speakers, or other Western languages, language speakers, like us English speakers that come from the Greek speakers, who trust in Jesus and are grafted into Israel can rightly be called Christians. Nevertheless, in the Bible's context, Christian is an outward name from the Greek culture of the first century. Still, this name honors Jesus. Christians are grafted into Israel and become part of God's chosen people by faith in Jesus, King of the Jews. Every Christian should consider all Jewish people their family and part of the same community. And on that note, we end with talking about God's desire for his people's unity. So consider today how many different denominations there are among Christians alone and among Jewish people also as we talked about last week. So with all these different denominations, God wants us to simplify things and not make it about ourselves because really we become so prideful in wanting to add other names to the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus being the only name by which all of us are saved. Truly, Jesus is the only word we need to know. So God wants all his true people who are his people by the Spirit to truly truly know him and love him and are brought in through Jesus' blood to be united regardless of what they call themselves and regardless of all their other differences. So I talked about how Paul alluded to this vision that Ezekiel had about the resurrection from the dead and what he was saying in Romans 11. In Ezekiel 37, the prophet Ezekiel has a vision of a valley of dead dry bones or skeletons. Yahweh commanded Ezekiel to prophesy life into the bones. The result is that Yahweh gives his spirit to the bones and brings the resurrection. In this context, Yahweh leads Ezekiel to prophesy the reunification of the divided kingdom 
kingdoms of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, and the southern kingdom of Judah. So I'm going to read part of this passage, jumping off from there. It says, The word of Yahweh came again to me, saying, Now as for you, son of Adam, take for yourself one tree branch and write on it for Judah and for the sons of Israel and his allies. Then take another tree branch and write on it for Joseph, the tree branch of Ephraim and all the house of Israel and his allies. Then draw them together for yourself one to another into one tree, that they may become one in your hand. And when the sons of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not declare to us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will take the tree of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, which remember, that's the fullness of nations that Jacob prophesied, and the tribes of Israel, his allies, and I will put them with it, with the tree of Judah and make them one tree and they will be one in my hand and the tree branches on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes and speak to them thus says Lord Yahweh behold I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they have gone and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land and I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel and one king will be king for all of them and they will no longer be two nations and no longer be divided into two kingdoms they also will no longer pollute themselves with their idols or with their disgustingness or with any of their rebellions. But I will liberate them from all their settlings wherein they have missed me, and I will purify them. And they will be my people, and I will be their God. And my servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. We know that's Jesus. And they will walk in my decisions and protect my stances and do them. They will live in the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, which our fathers lived in, and they will live in it, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. And I will share a partnership of peace with them. It will be an everlasting partnership with them. And I will give them and multiply them and will give my holy place in their inside forever. My home also will be with them, and I will be their God and they will be my people and the nations will know that I am Yahweh who makes Israel holy when my holy place is in their inside forever. So here we see Yahweh will reunite the two divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah into one and Yahweh's reunification will include all nations allied with Israel and Judah. All 12 tribes of Israel are included and all nations on earth are included if they're allied with Israel somehow. This oneness of all God's people in him causes his holy home to be on earth. Yahweh making his people one causes all nations to know him. This connects with Paul's revelation of God's one tree, with believing people from all nations grafted in through the holy root, which is Jesus. Also take note that this has not happened yet. This prophecy of Ezekiel, it's in the future. The divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah, they were never reunited. And really by Ezekiel's time, the northern kingdom of Israel had really been lost in many ways. There was a remnant that was reunited with the Jewish people. People. So in that sense, I guess you could say it was fulfilled in part. But what about those who were lost among the nations? And what about the allies, the nations that are mentioned here? So from all these different angles, you can clearly see that there's a future element to this prophecy that will bring about the unity of all God's people, no matter what they call themselves among Jews, Christians, Gentiles of all types. And this will ultimately bring the resurrection of the dead, God's home with us on earth, the new heavens and the new earth. So we close with Jesus's high priestly prayer, and it happened right before before Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's about to go to the cross and suffer and die for us for our sins. It's found in John chapter 17 and arguably it's the most important part of the entire Bible. Jesus reveals what eternal life is and prays for all his people everywhere to be one in God. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven he said, Father the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you even as you gave him authority over all flesh that to to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Messiah, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth by perfecting the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have shown your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have protected your word. 
word now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you for the sayings which you gave me i have given to them and they received and truly knew that i came out from you and they trusted that you sent me i ask on their behalf i do not ask on behalf of the world but of those whom you have given me for they are yours and all things that are mine are yours and yours are mine and i have been glorified in them and i am no longer in the world and they themselves are in the world and i come to you holy father protect them in your name which you have given me that they may be one even as we while i was with them i was protecting them in your name which you have given me and i guarded them and not one of them wasted but the son of waste so that the scripture would be fulfilled but now i come to you and these things i speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves i have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as i am not of the world i do not ask you to take them out of the world but to protect them from the evil one they are not of the world even as i am not of the world make them holy by the truth your word is truth as you sent me into the world i also sent them into the world for their sake i make myself holy that they themselves also may be made holy in truth i do not ask on behalf of these alone but for those also who trust in me through their word that they may all be one even as you father in me and i in you that they also may be in us so that the world may continually trust that you sent me the glory which you have given me i have given to them that they may be one just as we are one i in them and you in me that they may be perfected into one so that the world may continually know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me father i desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where i am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world o righteous father even the world has not known you yet i have known you and these have known that you sent me and i have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and i in them so as you guys saw the video cut out there in the middle of the live recording i said some other comments about various things i tried to make it up in the video of the screen that you saw one thing that i said at the end that's very important is the simplicity of god wanting to have a personal relationship with you relationship not religion and it doesn't really matter what we call ourselves it really matters where our heart is with god and what our true relationship the terms of our personal individual relationship with god is if you are part of jesus's sheep you hear his voice and you follow him and it doesn't matter even if you say you go to church or you're part of the church i believe the bible says the church is an illegitimate institution I think that's clear in the Bible, but I'm talking about the church of history. I'm talking about the church as it is today at large. I'm not talking about every single person who's a member of a church, obviously. It's about the heart. I believe there are Mormons out there. There are Muslims out there who truly know Jesus and somehow have a relationship with him. I know some people are going to disagree with me about that, but the truth is we are not the judge. I'm not the judge. You're not the judge. God is the judge, and he alone knows those who know him, who know Jesus, truly. And Jesus died for everyone. So I closed with that. And as God's people with all these different denominations, all the Jews and all the Gentiles, he wants all of us who are truly his to be one, to love one another. And even if we're not truly his, to show, to honor his name, honor his name, Hashem the name he is one he wants us to be one as he is so god i bless everyone who's watching online who sees this i thank you for them lead them into you into the truth in every area of their lives and liberate them from any lies they have believed that are preventing them from reaching the true purpose that you have for them in jesus name amen next week we're going to look at ephesians 3 and other scriptures that talk about our rightful place with jesus and how humanity is now being pitted against the wicked gods that had deceived us back in Genesis.